Now we talk about systemic sclerosis or scleroderma. Also, you see the SS abbreviation there. So the pre most presenting symptom in scleroderma is cutaneous involvement. And it appears in like 95% of the cases. So it's very, very uh, s specific, if you will, to systemic sclerosis. And the visceral involvement of the GI tract, lung, kidneys, heart, and skeletal muscles causes the majority of the morbidity and mortality of the disease. Systemic sclerosis can be classified into two groups. Uh, one, diffuse scleroderma, and two, the second type, limited scleroderma. Diffuse is the, is the worst, and limited scleroderma is the, the better of the two. So diffuse scleroderma, you get widespread skin involvement. It's a more of a rapid progression, and you, ha and you see early visceral signs of, of the, the disease. So if your GI tract, lungs, kidneys, heart, and skeletal muscle gets involved, then that's going to be a, more, a faster downward spiral, if you will. Limited scleroderma is uh, relatively mild skin involvement. It often is confined just to the fingers, the face. Uh, the involvement of the viscera occurs very late and kind of a benign course. So this is the pr the prognosis of limited scleroderma is better than the prognosis of diffuse scleroderma. This is also called Crest syndrome. So you've heard of Crest syndrome. That's limited scleroderma. So what these the C R E S T stand for is C is calcinosis and calcinosis is just calcium being deposited into the tissues. So you get calcium in the tissues, that's what causes calcinosis or this hardening of the skin or hardening of the tissue. Raynaud's phenomenon, you got kind of the first step and then the second step. Uh, let me scroll down here a bit. So you got the first step and the second step. The first step is you get some kind of vasoactive problem and then the skin turns white and then after that um, happens then the skin will then you'll get cyanosis uh, you know this bluish coloring of the skin and that's uh, due to ischemia so that's Raynaud's phenomenon we'll talk about that a little bit later esophageal dysmotility so as you eat food here you know it comes down and if you if it goes down the wrong pipe then it goes down the trachea and you cough that up. We've all experienced that before. But here is the esophagus. It runs posterior or behind the trachea, comes all the way down, then drops into your stomach. So here is the upper, jo upper esophageal sphincter and the lower esophageal sphincter, LES and UES. Sometimes in the literature it's called shortened to that. But you get a, kind of a calcinosis um, with the esophagus, with the esophagus, and so you have a hard time eating, uh, swallowing. Uh, they call that dysphagia, difficulty eating. So that can happen in this Crest syndrome, esophageal dysmotility. You get sclerodactyly. Dactyly refers to the fingers or to the digits, and sclera, scleroderma, hardening of it. So this tissue right here hardens and gets tightened real tight and you lose uh, mobility in the joints because the skin gets so tight and hard and you can also have ulcers. Ulcers. And you get telangtasia and you can see these little blood vessels here. Let me delete that so you can see the blood vessel. But the blood vessel here, you just they start popping up and you can just kind of see them there. Now let's talk about the etiology and pathogenesis. What is believed to happen is, again, cause unknown, is the fibroblast activa activa activation with excessive fibrosis. So somehow these fibroblasts, fibroblasts are cells inside your uh, tissues and your skin and your loose connective tissue that lay down collagen which then causes you know that uh, rigor or toughness to your skin so the fibroblasts somehow they get activated which then causes excessive fibrosis equal that's the under that's the hallmark feature of systemic sclerosis so 
they thought they think that some abnormal activation of the immune system and the microvascular injury and it's not the fibroblast or collagen synthesis synthesis that it's not the fibroblast or collagen synthesis that is bad. It's actually some normal activation, abnormal activation of the immune system and results in microvascular injury. And it's believed that the CD4 cells respond to some kind of antigen present in the skin. And then, that, then the CD4s, they do their jobs by releasing cytokines that then activate mast cells and macrophages. And then those cells release fibrogenic cytokines like interleukin-1, PDGF, TG-beta, and fibroblast growth factors. So these mast cells and macrophages, uh, well, the first the CD4 cells get activated by some kind of antigen. They release cytokines that recruit mast cells and macrophages. And then these cells secrete these cytokines that cause, uh, you know, fibrosis to occur. Now, some of the dr tests is they have the ANAs, the anti-nuclear antibodies that are very that are highly specific to the disease. And so uh, some of these ANAs are directed against the DNA topoisomerase 1 or the anti-SCL70 that's that's the diagnostic test. It's highly specific for diffuse systemic scler sclerosis or 70% of patients have uh, this uh, highly specific ANA directed towards this uh, protein or this uh, enzyme here, and this is this is what it's called. Seventy percent have that with the diffuse systemic sclerosis, so the kind of the worst of the two. And then for the limited scleroderma, about ninety percent of patients have the anti-centromere antibody. So. Remember those for your tests. Microvascular disease is consistently present. Um, the mechanisms of endothelial injury is unknown. So what happens is that you have repeated cycles of this microvascular disease and endothelial damage. Now with the repeated cycles, you're going to get a release of platelet factors. Okay. Now that eventually over time leads to periadventitial fibrosis. So the uh, the inside of your blood vessels are becoming fibrous because of constant trauma, 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 repeated micro traumas, and then you get narrowing of the microvasculature because if you have a blood vessel here on diameter here, and I keep I keep injuring it, you know, over time it's going to fibrose, and then all over you're going to get a narrowing of the microvascular, which will eventually lead to ischemic injury, and that's. Uh, not good. So let's talk about the clinical course now. So systemic sclerosis affects uh, three times as many women as it does men with the peak incidence of 50 to 60 year olds. The presentation is very similar to uh, of scleroderma is very similar to rheumatoid arthritis, systemic lupus erythematosus, and dermatomyositis, which we'll talk about later. And the distinctive feature of SS, or systemic sclerosis, is the cutaneous involvement. Most patients, however, do develop Raynaud's phenomenon. And what Raynaud's phenomenon is, is we kind of showed those pictures up there, but typically the hands turn white on exposure to cold. So kind of cold is a trigger. And then they, uh, the reflecting vasospasm occurs, turning it white. And then you get a blue color, and that's due to ischemia uh, and the cyanosis. And then finally, the color changes back to red as a reactive vasodilation. So if you have a, you know, if you have a, a finger here, this one I got a kind of a swan neck deformity. But nonetheless, if you have a little blood of you know a vessel coming down here so first it's going to start turning white so it goes white and then it goes blue and then it goes red so the colors of the US of A USA colors so the the it turns white and then it turns blue to ischemia and cyanosis and then then you'll get vasodilation at the end because you know it's been under cyanotic, so then 
you know, you'll get a lot of blood flow into the arrow, which then causes it red. So that's what Raynaud's phenomenon is. Progressive colonization of the skin leads to atrophy of the hands, um, increasing stiffness, and eventually complete immobilization of the joints because then you have the progressive colonization. Do you have uh, difficulty swallowing in uh, that esophageal dysmotility and the crest syndrome? Uh, you have esophageal fibrosis and you get hypomotility. Now, if malabsorption might also occur if the submucosal and the mucosal layers of the small intestine become atrophied, if you get fibrosis there, patients are going to have a hard time absorbing stuff through the gut. So you might have to take a look at that. You can have dyspnea and chronic cough that will reflect the pulmonary changes. So if a patient, in, you know, as the disease progresses, might have a hard time breathing, might have just coughing a lot because the pulmonary, they're becoming calcified. And if advanced lung occurs, then you could get secondary pulmonary hypertension. And we talked about, you know, here, let's see here, that's out of the screen here. So if you have a heart here, you have the vessels that go up to the lungs. This is the lung, lung. And then they come back, drain into the heart. So if these are, if these lungs are creating a lot of resistance, if they're having a lot of changes, then this makes the right side of the heart right side of the heart that pumps into this pulmonary circulation. If, it, if there's a lot of resistance here, well, this right side of the heart is going to have to do a lot more work. So that's why you see right-sided cardiac failure is secondary to this lung involvement. If you get renal functional impairment, uh, that is probably due to uh, both the secondary events and advancement of the systemic systemic sclerosis so the hardening of the kidneys happens but also you got malignant hypertension due to this the this lung here so that could be a problem most patients of the disease kind of pursues as a kind of a steady slow uh, downhill downhill course unfortunately over the span of many years, many years. So the overall 10 year survival rate is 35 to 70%. That's, you know, it's a kind of a slow, steady downhill uh, course, if you will. And the survival are significantly better with localized scleroderma rather than diffuse. So diffuse is kind of the worst of the two and localized scleroderma crest syndrome is not as bad. Okay, we'll see you in the next video.